Hello everyone, welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today's big idea is a somewhat tricky one. It's one that has received uh, both attention and also a little bit of controversy within physics as well as in philosophy, and that is the idea of emergence. Emergence in the sense of what we might call a higher level theory emerging from a lower level one. And I'm going to use a lot of words like what we might call in this video because some of these uh, ideas are not agreed on, or at least the way to talk about them are, is not agreed on. So I'm going to try mostly to stick to things that are indisputably true rather than diving into the most controversial aspects of the subject. Uh, but be aware that out there, there are people who use the words in slightly different meanings and disagree with with each other. Nevertheless, this is a topic of emergence that deserves its place in the biggest ideas in the universe because it's part of this program we're doing in the most recent couple videos of mapping, matching the microphysics, the fundamental physics of quantum field theory or whatever the ultimate theory of everything turns out to be, to the observed world that we see. You know, remember we talked about probability and things like that, the fact that we're not Laplace's demon. So now we can get a little bit more deeply into what can we do, given that we are not Laplace's demon, uh, can we nevertheless talk usefully about the universe? That's where emergence really is crucial. It's not just optional, right? It's really, really crucial. So we absolutely have to face up to this idea. Uh, so let me just do a little bit of explaining what, where the idea of emergence comes from uh, in science. The idea, again, these are going to be the ideas that I'm going to assume are true for the rest of this video. You may disagree. That's okay. You may always disagree. Uh, there is only one reality. And this might seem like a strange thing for someone who believes in the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics to say, but for many worlds or for an ever ready, and the, the reality is the multiverse. It is the all the worlds, all at once, okay? So this is not talking about branches of the wave function. This is talking about the global wave function of the universe. Um, so we're assuming there is something called reality. There's not that many people who think that there's not anything called reality, but there are plenty of people who think that the job of science is not to describe reality. They distinguish between what may or may not exist as reality and our observational outcomes when we look at the world. And they say the job of science is just to describe what we see when we look, not to describe what is really there. So I am not in that camp. So I don't even know how to talk that language. So I'm going to assume there's something called reality that we're trying to describe. But there are multiple, many, many, many theories that can describe reality all at once. So there are multiple theories describing reality in different useful ways. So the idea is that you can sort of capture different, in fact, let's say different accurate ways, not just useful. Useful is a little bit weaker than I want to say. You can capture different aspects of reality using different theories of physics. So just to give away the game right away, the classic example is the one we already talked about last time with uh, atoms and molecules and kinetic theory being some kind of attempt at a fundamental theory in 19th century physics. And then the emergent theory is a theory of gases or fluids or whatever, thermodynamics, okay? Therm thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, etc. So you don't need to know all the details about all the molecules to nevertheless have a good theory of the world. So the idea here is the, the what we're saying here is that the multiple theories we have in mind would be the kinetic theory of the atoms and molecules and also the fluid dynamics theory all by itself. So you can derive fluid dynamics from atoms and molecules, but you knew fluid dynamics first, right? Or let's put it this way. I don't forget about whatever that historically actually happened. You don't need to know about atoms and molecules to have fluid mechanics, okay? It's an independent, autonomous way of talking about the world that is accurate in a certain regime and not in others, okay? Uh, and that's what I wanna say here. These theories can be different. Theories that can be different, I already said that. The theories should agree in overlapping domains. So the idea here is that there is something called the domain of applicability of the theory. When you have the fluid dynamics description, 
if you know that there is also a more comprehensive atomic kinetic theory description, you don't expect the fluid dynamics description to tell you anything in the regime when you only have one molecule in your system, right? It becomes true in the limit when you have many, many, many molecules. So there are different domains, one molecule, many, many, many molecules. In some domains, the theories are either going to be completely inapplicable or they will disagree. But when they are accurately describing reality, there is a regime in which they overlap and then they agree with each other. So that's the basis, you know, that's based on this fact that we think that there is a reality. So where the theories overlap and are supposed to be valid, they both better or they all better be describing reality. Okay. And to be honest, usually uh, you can talk to scientists a lot and they will very rarely use the word reality. <laughs> They're not against it, but they know better. They know that they don't know what reality is. They assume it's out there, most of them. But what we know, what we have our models and what we have our experimental data, and we have some interplay between those. We like to think that our models get better and better at capturing reality, but to a large extent, when we talk about emergence in this way, and we talk about the relationship of some higher level theory to some lower level theory, we're talking about relationships between theories themselves, rather than relationships between theories and reality, because who knows what that is? I mean, the relationship is we capture some of it, but who knows how much of it, who knows what captures the rest, etc. So the basic picture that we have, to, do, to say the same thing we just said, but to say it in pictures, um, emergence, the usual way it's used, and we'll be a little bit more careful uh, later on, but the notion of emergence is a, and again, the usual way, higher level, and that usually is taken to mean macroscopic, large scale, many moving pieces going on underneath, uh, theory emerges, emerging from a lower level microscopic theory. And you could also say fundamental instead of microscopic. Um, that annoys people, but none of these words are, are exactly right. I mean, fundamental makes it sound like it's more important, which is just false, okay? Just because a theory describes what goes on in a more comprehensive way doesn't mean it's more important, right? If you wanna get from here to the moon, Newtonian gravity is more important than quantum gravity, okay? Or even more important than general relativity. It helps get you there in an inefficient way. Uh, so fundamental is, doesn't have exactly the right connotations. Microscopic isn't right either because the theory is supposed to be true at every level. It's just that it becomes important at uh, tinier levels. I once tried to uh, have a campaign to replace the phrase fundamental physics by the phrase elementary physics. Elementary in the sense of basic, like, you know, the, the stuff out of which you could potentially derive everything else, but also unlike fundamental, elementary sounds a little deflationary, right? It sounds like, oh, it's just the simple stuff. It's not the, you know, the, the big hard stuff. No one agreed with my uh, proposal though, so that didn't really catch on. So higher level and lower level uh, are another way of saying the same thing. You just gotta remember which is higher and which is lower. So the way we do that is we say, you know, here is reality, again, this is something that I'll mention, but most scientists can get away without talking about. And then there's some microscopic theory, by which we mean a theory that purports to be comprehensive, as comprehensive as it can be, describing reality. And it might not do the whole thing. So let me, all right, yeah, let me see if I can do this. I'm gonna take this ellipse. I am gonna duplicate it. So I get exactly the same ellipse, but I'll put it down there. And the idea is that this region of reality is described by this theory, okay? But then there's some smaller region of reality, which is like a, a, a subset. You, and again, this is just the usual picture. We'll try to be more careful later. But usually when you have the gas versus the, you know, the, the fluid dynamics description versus the atoms description, there is a smaller domain of applicability for the gas description in principle you could always describe what's going on in a box of gas just in terms of the atoms and molecules. It might be very impractical, but that's what Laplace's demon would do. So there's some strictly smaller theory, the macro theory, that describes the uh, macroscopic world. Do the same trick here, put that down there, and then say, 
Here is the region of reality. Oops, I should do this down here also, shouldn't I? Region of reality. Uh, what did I do? Oh my goodness. I don't know where that came from. I should just delete this from the video. No, I'll leave it in for the video. People like it when I do silly things in the real time in the video. There we go. Okay. So there is some macro theory that is a subset of the micro theory and therefore describes a smaller part of reality. And hopefully, ideally, all of these are going to be well understood, all these relationships. And so this is the emergent theory in this case. That's roughly speaking what we, what we mean. Now, the reason why I have to be so weaselly worded about this and keep you know, saying not everyone agrees is because, uh, again, to preview a little bit, there are people who think that there is an important difference between a theory that is microscopic and a theory that is comprehensive. So what is implicit in a lot of these discussions of emergence is that the microscopic theory literally describes tiny little pieces that somehow come together to form big pieces in the macroscopic theory. That's kind of what happens when you go from uh, atoms to a box of gas, but it's not what happens in quantum mechanics, for example, where things are much more subtle. And maybe it's not what happens in things like consciousness. You can talk about whether there's a theory of consciousness that emerges from a theory of neurons in the brain, and there people are less happy, some people are less willing to think that a microscopic theory of neurons could in principle describe macroscopic consciousness. That's a more contentious topic anyway. But anyway, this is, this is the basic picture that we have in mind. Let's get into some details. Let's give you some examples. So the classic example that we already mentioned is atoms or particles emerging into gases. I had to look up whether it's just one S or two S in the middle of gases. It's one S. I've typed that word a million times in my life, but there you go. So the more microscopic theory is the theory of atoms or molecules or particles or whatever. And you have some uh, point in gamma space or you have endpoints in mu space in the language that we used last time. So you have some phase space variables xi, pi. Okay, the position and momentum of every single particle in the gas. Uh, in the box of gas or whatever, and then you have some theory up here of the gas or the fluid, whatever it's going to be, and there the language you speak is a completely different language, and that's the important point here. You talk about the density, the pressure, the temperature, the velocity field of the gas, and so forth. So in this case, this is a very, very special case, because here you can actually derive the higher level macroscopic rules. There is literally a map you can construct from the microscopic situation to the macroscopic situation. Um, so I'm not going to do that in any detail, but you know basically how it works. The density, I know that you might not be familiar with the, the Greek letter rho being used for density, but that's what we used. The density comes from uh, the number density of particles of atoms times the mass per particle. So the density here, we really mean the mass density. And these are both things you can work out if you know where you are in phase space for all the particles. You can figure out how many particles there are in a region and what their masses are, right? You know that. Uh, the temperature comes from the average kinetic energy of the particles comes from means it's proportional to, and the proportionality depends on details about you know how much they spin, how many dimensions you're in, things like that. Um, the pressure comes from you know the force across uh, an imaginary barrier. So what we mean there is imagine that in your box of gas you put down a little wall. And then you said, well, I have a bunch of particles here. They're going to bump into the wall and then careen off. And I can figure out the total force there. If that wall were there, that's what the pressure is. The pressure is how much force would be exerted on you if you put your hand in there. Okay. So you can calculate all of those from these um, quantities that you're given in the microscopic theory, but that's unusual. That is not necessary in any sense. It is far more common 
that you discover the macroscopic theory completely independently of knowing the microscopic theory. And that, by the way, is number one, amazing, the fact that that's how nature works. Uh, and number two, a perfectly good reason why you need things other than fundamental physics in your life, okay? This is the fundamental um, lesson of a very famous article written by Philip Anderson, Nobel Prize winning physicist who passed away recently. He wrote an article in the early 70s for Physics Today, I think it was, called More is Different. And the point of the article was it's when you have a collection of many things, atoms or electrons or whatever, and you consider their collective behavior, there are things that happen that in practice you never would have guessed from knowing what the individual constituents were. There is collective behavior that gives rise to new kinds of phenomena, whether it's superconductivity or phase transitions or whatever. In principle, maybe you could have taken the microscopic picture, put it on a computer or given it to Laplace's demon and figured out exactly what happened. But there's a way of talking about what happens purely at the higher level that gives you some amount of insight that is irrelevant, that is that is um, independent, I should say, of what's going on at the lower level. That's why Anderson says that more is different. Now, there's an ongoing controversy uh, between different camps of people about whether or not you could, in principle, put the microscopic theory on a computer and simulate it, or whether or not it's so different once you get to the macroscopic level that you couldn't even do that. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. What I really wanted to say, so the two things I want to say about this picture right here are, number one, in principle, there's this relationship between the micro theory and the macro theory. It might be impossible or difficult to derive, but in principle, it's there. But number two, you notice in this case that the relationship between the micro theory and macro theory changed the very nature of what we said exists. OK, in the micro theory, you said, All right, what is this thing? What is this box of what? You have a box of what? What is it? And you say, well, it's a collection of particles. They have certain masses, certain positions, certain velocities. But if you were speaking the vocabulary of the emergent higher level theory, someone says a box of what? You say, oh, it's a, it's a gas with a certain temperature and pressure. It's a completely different set of words and concepts that you're using. And that's kind of the magic of emergence there. You're describing the same thing in two very different ways. And we're going to get pretty deep into exactly how different that can be. Um, but so this is a, a very common example. But let me give you another example, which is equally true and relevant, but kind of sneaks under the radar a little bit. So let's call this the sneaky example of emergence. And that is center of mass motion, by which we mean when you talk about, you know, we already mentioned uh, going to the moon in a spacecraft. You talk about celestial mechanics, the earth going around the sun, the moon going around the earth, whatever. If you want to solve, if you're, you know, people do this, you want to solve for the motion of the earth through the solar system over millions of years, okay? So you need to account not only for the moon and the earth, but also all the other planets, and even like the shape of the, of the earth a little bit. But to a very, very, very good first approximation, you just need to know, as far as the Earth is concerned, its center of mass and the velocity of that center of mass. So you have the whole Earth here, Earth, for example, and of course the Earth is made of many, many particles, roughly 10 to the 50th particles in the Earth, depending on how you count. I'm not sure why I think that's true. There's some number embedded in my brain, in my memory, but uh, in a recent video, I mixed up uh, lithium and beryllium, so you shouldn't really trust what's embedded in my brain. Um, but there's a center of mass for all those particles, and you can figure out where that is, and then there is a velocity or a center of mass uh, momentum also. So you have x center of mass and p center of mass. And one of the very crucial things that Isaac Newton himself figured out was that in terms of Newtonian gravity, that's all you need. If the objects are spherical, you don't need all of the information about the individual particles. You can boil the information you need down to where the center of mass is, and then from there, you can get the orbit of the Earth to very, very high approximation. Not perfectly because, you know, there are tidal forces. The, the fact that the moon orbits the earth, which you know is true, and you can get, again, a good approximation to that, both from the center of masses of both of them. But the moon also gradually moves away 
from the Earth. And that's because of tidal friction between the moving, the rotating Earth and Moon. And to understand that, you need to go beyond the center of mass approximation. But this is a really, really good approximation. And it's an example of emergence because the theory that you're using to describe the Earth going around the Sun is a theory of a point a point mass with three coordinates for its position and three momentum, right? That's not what the Earth actually is, but it's a really good emergent description of it. So in both of these cases, we have a situation where uh, there is a many-to-one map when you do that emergent description from micro to macro. What we mean by that is for the gases up here, if you're, and this is, you should be familiar with this from the entropy that we talked about in the last video, um, given the density as a function of space and the temperature as a function of space and the pressure, etc., there are many microscopic points in phase space that would look like that macroscopically up to some, you know, tolerance or precision or error bar. Likewise, given the center of mass of the Earth and the center of mass momentum of the Earth, there are many arrangements of the individual atoms and molecules that make up the Earth that would give you that. So there's a many-to-one map, and that is the phenomenon we call coarse graining. So both of these examples of emergent phenomena are ones where coarse graining plays a role, but that's actually not, that's not necessary. I'll talk a little bit about what that means. What I, wanna, what I wanna emphasize here is that when we talked in the last video about entropy, uh, coarse graining played an important role in Boltzmann's definition of entropy, right? The entropy was the logarithm of the number of microstates in a coarse grained macrostate. Um, but that was just descriptive of the configuration that we were looking at, right? So when we talked about the evolution of the state, we sort of talked about it microstate by microstate. We said that it's probable that most microstates will do this or that. This emergence thing is a deeper claim because this is saying that not only can we coarse grain, but when we coarse grain, so when we map all of the microstates of the Earth into its just a center of mass, that leaves us enough information to predict what's going to happen next. There is an autonomous theory of the coarse-grained states themselves. We didn't need to make that claim when we were talking about entropy. We just said, well, there's some macroscopic observables, and that's what we're going to keep track of. Here we're making the much stronger claim that that coarse-graining that comes from macroscopic observables or whatever are give us enough information to make a predictive theory about what's going to happen next. That's kind of an amazing fact, and that's why emergence is so awesome. Um, also, by the way, I forget, am I supposed to say this now? Yeah, I'll, I'll say it later. There's another amazing fact that I will say later. Uh, good, so let me contrast this. Both of these cases where there's a many-to-one map, there are also cases where there's just a one-to-one -one map, okay? So there's there are also cases of limits rather than coarse graining. And this is, does this count as emergence when you take a limit of a theory and get another theory? I don't know, who cares? I don't, I don't really care what the official definition is. This is a related concept and you should be clear when one concept is relevant versus another one. So for example, what I mean by this, I mean by this, well, let's just do the example and it'll be clear. So consider general relativity. You're all experts in general relativity because you've seen the video called Gravity where we talk about what general relativity says. For those of you who might not have, those of you living a thousand years from now, going through the archival footage, uh, first look at the video on curvature, on geometry and topology. Then you can do the, vi the video on general relativity. Um, and general relativity theory of gravity and curved space-time, and it's sort of a generalization of special relativity in some sense, because special relativity is a set of rules that forces there to be no gravity, okay? And the rules of special relativity, gravity is not there, space-time is completely flat. So we can think of special relativity as a limit of general relativity where we turn gravity off. You can do this formally. You can send uh, Newton's constant to zero, the, the Newton's constant of gravity, capital G, right? If it were zero, then gravity wouldn't exist and you wouldn't have any curvature of space-time. Um, so you can, you can take general relativity, I should move this up here a little bit, and take a limit where you turn gravity off and you can get special relativity. There's a different limit you can take. 
because sometimes you have like in the solar system, what if you want to calculate the precession of mercury, okay, like Einstein actually did? You don't need the full-blown apparatus of uh, all of general relativity. You don't need to worry about gravitational waves or something like that. Um, so there is an approximation. And you can go even further than that. What if you just wanted to calculate the motion of a rocket going from here to the moon? What you really need is Newtonian gravity, right? That's all you need. You could do it in general relativity, but it's a whole bunch of formalism and math and Greek indices you don't really uh, that are not helpful or necessary. So what you want to say is that in a certain regime, Newtonian gravity is just as good as general relativity. And that regime is formalized by taking a limit. The limit is uh, gravity exists to get Newtonian gravity. Can't get rid of gravity entirely. But gravity is weak, okay? So when gravity is weak, you can't have things like black holes or you can't have things like the Big Bang or anything like that. Um, but this is not enough because even when gravity is weak, there is uh, things that Newton's theory cannot handle, namely anything moving near the speed of light, like a gravitational wave, for example. Uh, likewise, if the planets in the solar system were moving close to the speed of light, relativistic effects would be important and Newtonian gravity would not be enough. So the Newtonian gravity limit of general relativity is both when gravity is weak and velocities are much, much less than the speed of light. When particles are moving slowly and gravity is weak, you can show, you can buy my textbook in general relativity, space, time, and geometry, and we will derive Newtonian gravity from general relativity in this limit. And then you can sort of combine these limits. You can take special relativity and take the limit where velocities are much, much less than the speed of light. Or you could take Newtonian gravity and turn gravity off entirely. And in both cases, what you would just get is Newtonian mechanics, non-gravitational Newtonian mechanics. So this is a, a nice, easy to understand case where certain comprehensive theories have limiting cases. And it's exactly, you know, they fit together in exactly this way, right? The comprehensive theory general relativity has a wider domain of applicability than special relativity or Newtonian physics. Um, but the difference is, in the examples I gave earlier, there was coarse graining. Right? We were forgetting information. Whereas the, these are fine-grained limits. These are one-to-one -one maps. One-to-one. -one. Between a situation in general relativity, a situation in general relativity uniquely defines a situation in Newtonian gravity, for example. Okay? It's not that there are many, many different little microscopic pieces moving around in general relativity that all look the same to Newtonian gravity. It's just that there are regimes where general relativity works and Newtonian gravity doesn't. And works is important here because Newtonian gravity still exists in those regimes, right? Like you can take as much energy density or mass density as you want and squeeze it into a ball and say, what would the description of that be in Newtonian gravity? If the general relativistic description was a black hole, that means that Newtonian gravity doesn't work there, but it still says something, right? It still exists. So the theory itself, if I, I guess, uh, what I mean is that oftentimes the macro theory exists or, or says things in a wide region. They're just not true things. <laughs> They're just not things that actually describe what is happening in the world. So you get both of these kinds of behaviors. You can get immersion theories both from a many-to-one kind of coarse graining map or just one-to-one -one uh, fine-grained maps in the case of limits. So if we want to classify all the different ways that theory can emerge at higher levels versus lower levels, in this case, by the way, in these limiting cases, it's not even clear people would use a higher level versus lower level uh, language, but sometimes they would. And again, I don't care what the language is that they would use. So basically, there are two questions that you want to ask about maps between theories. that will help you sort of understand what's going on. One is, do they have the same structure or ontology, as the philosophers would say? Ontology is just the set of things, right? The objects, the notions, the ideas out of which the theory is constructed. So if the structures are the same, then we can call them homeostructural, same structure. 
And if they're not, then they would be heterostructural. And we saw examples of that, right? The center of mass motion was the same kind of theory. It was just Newtonian mechanics of positions and velocities, just in a much smaller number of variables. So the structure was the same. Whereas when we went from the atoms to the gas, the structure was something completely different. And the other question, which we all just, which we just said, uh, are, are the maps one to one or many to one? Let me draw this as an arrow. And if it's one to one, then we say that the maps are fine-grained. And if it's many to one, then they're coarse-grained. And there are examples of all of these, right? So you get two questions, you have two answers each, so there's a little two by two grid, and we can do that. We can, we can draw the grid and we can fill it in. So here is uh, homeostructural same kind of structures, same ontology, or heterostructural, and then there are fine-grained maps, and then there are coarse-grained maps. Okay, so uh, what is an example of a fine-grained map that is homeostructural? Well, what you're saying here is that one state in a theory maps onto one state of another theory, and the kinds of states are the same kind of thing. So in other words, nothing really changed, right? But maybe you have a good theory and a bad theory, or maybe you have a, a theory that is accurate in a wide variety of circumstances, and another theory that just claims to be a simplification in some sense. So basically what you have in this, in this box up here are theories that are just simplifications of bigger theories. Not really. This is where uh, the word emergence would rarely be used, I think, in this particular case. But for example, uh, you know, any of the old spherical cow examples that we talked about, you know, frictionless planes. A ball rolling down a frictionless plane, that's described within Newtonian mechanics with the same ontology of points in phase space and forces and F equals MA and so forth you've just decided to ignore friction, right? So you haven't changed the structure and you haven't changed the number of different states in the theory or anything like that. You just simplified your life. So that's that's a thing you can do, but it's not very highbrow in terms of what you mean by emergence. Um, for the homeostructural, same structure, but coarse grained, well, then we have center of mass motion, right? That's a very good example. For different structures, fine grained, well, general relativity mapping onto Newtonian gravity, the Newtonian limit of GR. It's a different kind of structure because general relativity says what the world is, is a curved Lorentzian space-time manifold. That's what it says it is, right? And Newtonian gravity doesn't say that. Newtonian gravity says that space and time are absolute and there's a gravitational potential field on top of that, which obeys certain equations, the inverse square law, for example. So the language that you speak has become different, um, even though it's describing the same set of things in the domain where Newtonian gravity works. And then the biggest sort of, you know, most interesting box here is when you coarse grain and have a different structure. So for example, when atoms are coarse grain to give you a gas or fluid description. So all of these actually happen, which is a good thing to keep in mind when you're debating different examples or uh, aspects of emergence. And so with that little classification scheme in mind, let me mention a couple of features. Just let me mention two quick features that you should keep in mind. One is um, the thing that I said I was going to tell you, which is an amazing fact up here with, you know, the Earth um, being describable in terms of its center of mass. I'm not quite sure exactly how to phrase this best. But what I wrote down here was uh, emergence is precious. <laughs> so what I mean by this is um, when you do this example of taking the Earth with 10 to the 50th particles and describing it in terms of its center of mass, you're, you know, you're saying 
every particle lives in a six dimensional phase space, right? So I didn't, you know, get did not only getting the order of magnitude right here, but the phase space for the earth is something like 10 to the 50 or 10 to the 50 one dimensional. And you're saying I can describe its motion to a good approximation by appointing a six dimensional phase space. So what I'm doing by this coarse graining procedure is I'm throwing away a lot of information. I could write down the positions and velocities of every particle in the Earth in the center of mass frame of the Earth, right? So I could give you what the center of mass is, and I could give you the positions and velocities of all the particles relative to that center of mass. And what I'm telling you here is that none of those relative positions and velocities matter at all. I can ignore them. I can throw them away. Once I've told you what the center of mass is doing, that's all I need to know. And that's what's extremely precious. That's what I'm trying to get at here, because the idea that I can take some system described by an enormous number of variables, an enormous number of degrees of freedom, and not tell you what the overwhelming majority of degrees of freedom are doing is amazing. Uh, it's not generic, it's not robust, it doesn't usually work. Just imagine I told you, you know, so what I'm, what I'm saying is for that example, we've thrown away, you know, all but one in 10 to the 50th of the pieces of data. Okay, uh, but there are simple examples where I throw away half the data, so I'm throwing away much, much less, and I get nothing. What if I've told you the position of every particle in the Earth? So that's way more information, but I haven't told you the velocity of any of the particles in the Earth, okay? Tell me how the Earth moves. <laughs> you can't do it at all. You know nothing about how it's moving, even though I've given you enormously more information. If you get right down to it, if I give you the position of every particle in the Earth and the velocity of every particle except for one, what can you tell me about what the Earth's going to do next? Nothing. Literally nothing. And you say, well, no, I think the Earth's probably going to move over here. But it's always possible that that one particle has a momentum in the other direction bigger than the total momentum of all the other particles, right? Strictly speaking, if I didn't give you that momentum, I can tell you nothing. So the idea that you can throw away information, uh, an enormous amount of information, all but a tiny little sliver of information, and still get a theory that, predict it, that predicts accurately what's going to happen next is enormously special and non-generic and precious, okay? It reflects something real and important about the nature of reality that such descriptions exist at all. There's no theorem that says when I have a theory described by 10 to the 50th degrees of freedom, there exists a description where I only need to keep track of a handful of them and I can figure out what's going to happen next. That is very, that's very weird in some sense, right? I don't know why it's true. I mean, maybe you can argue for it, but I don't think it's anything we understand at a very deep level. So this relates to what Daniel Dennett calls uh, real patterns. I did a podcast with Dan Dennett. If you want to talk, if you want to see his uh, viewpoints on this, the point being that um, sometimes when people talk about these coarse-grained, high-level descriptions, they will give you the impression that what they really are are conveniences. Right? It's easier to deal with this coarse-grained approximate description. And often they want to do that because they want to question or undermine the idea that the higher level things are real, right? Tables and chairs aren't real, just atoms are real or something like that. But then it says, no, the fact that there is this pattern, the fact that you can ignore almost all the data and still find out what's going to happen next in the life of this macroscopic system is a real objective fact about the system. So these higher level things deserve to be called real. They, they have an ontology of their own. There really is the center of mass of the earth. There really is a table and a chair, even though those are higher level emergent phenomena. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say um, is there's a phenomenon called universality or uh, it's called different things in different contexts in a in a sort of computation or consciousness context, it would be called substrate independence. And the idea here is that if you go back up to the gas, okay, uh, you can have some atoms, you can have this gas, you can derive the, the properties of the gas from the atoms. But as I said, you could have found the laws of fluid mechanics without knowing anything about atoms. 
in fact, you can have two gases whose you know, important qualities are the same, their densities, their pressures, and the equations governing their motions are the same, but they're made of different atoms, right? So you can have the same microscopic theory, or, sorry, you can have two different microscopic theories giving you the same macroscopic behavior, the same emergent behavior. In other words, knowing what happens at the emergent level is not enough to fix what happens at the microscopic level. You were familiar with this actually from when we talked about the renormalization way back when. We talked about the fact that, uh, you know, compare this to the idea of ultraviolet completions. What we said was, you know, in renormalization theory, we admit that we don't know what's going on at very small length scales, very high energies. So we say, but that's okay. We can find a theory that only applies to the low wave, to the low energies and long wavelengths, the infrared theory. And there can be more than one possible ultraviolet completion that gives us the same infrared behavior. So this is a good news, bad news situation, as is so often the case. Uh, I mean, by the way, in the in the computation or consciousness world, the substrate independence is the idea that consciousness or thought should be thought of as a process, and that process can be instantiated in neurons, but it could equally well be instantiated in silicon, you know, in a computer or something like that. And again, now when you put it that way, people might be more reluctant to sign on. Some people are all for it, and some people are more uh, skeptical. But the good news is we can say useful things about the macroscopic world without knowing the theory of everything, right? We can fly a rocket to the moon without knowing the complete theory of quantum gravity because we can get an emergent theory that is very, very accurate without knowing the microscopic one. The bad news is we can know the, micro the, the emergent theory and still not know the microscopic theory. So this is why, as we mentioned in the uh, renormalization video, it's hard to get data at something like the Large Hadron Collider that is relevant to quantum gravity because that's in a regime which is just not described. Like there's many things that could potentially be going on at the Planck scale where quantum gravity is important that would lead to the same behavior at the Large Hadron Collider or at observable everyday energies. So this the potential existence of universality, many microscopic theories giving the same macroscopic behavior, that's a problem in some sense for physicists. It gets, it gets in the way sometimes, but it's there, it's real. So we gotta deal with it, there you go. Okay, so for the rest of this video, I'm not done yet. This is now, we, we, we're gonna shift gears a little bit because um, much of the discussion of emergence in the emergence literature uh, uses examples like either boxes of gas or human beings, either you know consciousness in human beings or the relationship between sociology and psychology and stuff like that. What I'm most interested in is quantum mechanics, and I think the quantum mechanics is a crucially important example to look at carefully here, how the classical world emerges from the quantum world. And I think that most people don't do a very good job of it. So let's, you know, you've already become experts on quantum mechanics. Now you're an expert on emergence. Let's put them together and uh, dig a little bit more deeply than you will usually get told. So let's look at the relationship of quantum to classical mechanics which is a relationship of emergence. The classical world emerges from the quantum world. Let's try to fit it in to the framework that we've already uh, given. And there is a usual story. So let me tell you the usual story and how it falls short a little bit, okay? The usual story relies on, you know, when I say the usual story, I mean, when you ever say a story is usual, it depends on what community of people you're talking about. I mean, this is what you usually find in textbooks. There are experts who have a more sophisticated story than this. But the usual story invokes something called Ehrenfest's theorem. Paul Ehrenfest, a uh, great statistical and quantum physicist, early 20th century, friend with Einstein and Bohr and things like that. I once gave the Ehrenfest lecture at the University of Leiden. That doesn't make me so special. Many people have given the lecture, but it's a fun thing to do. Um, and he has a theorem that talks that is very, very important for the relationship of the quantum world to the classical world. So he says, consider a particle moving in a potential. So here is position x, and here's v of x, okay? So you have a particle with a wave function moving in this potential. And he says, uh, classically, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to relate the quantum description to the classical description, okay? So let's first remember the, the classical description. Well, the time derivative of the position is given by the momentum over the mass, and the time derivative of the momentum 
is given by minus the slope of the potential, the, deriv the derivative of the potential with respect to x. Okay, So you have some classical particle, it's going to roll down. The slope in this case is going that way, that's the direction in which, sorry, the slope in this case is negative, so it pushes the particle to the right. Okay. Um, good, and we would like to know, well, okay, what happens quantum mechanically that we can derive this from? We would like to see this emerge. We'd like to start with the Schrodinger equation and derive this classical behavior in some limit or something, right? Some situation, anyway. So what do we do? Well, there's already a problem. There's a huge problem. Let me uh, rearrange this to make it a little bit more convenient. Um, the huge problem is the ontology is completely different, as we've been emphasizing over and over again. Uh, in classical mechanics, a particle is a point in phase space. It has a position and it has a momentum. Those are things that exist. In quantum mechanics, the particle is described by a wave function, right? So in QM, you have psi of x and t. So for one thing, p, the momentum doesn't even appear there. As we talked about way back when, momentum has to do with the wavelength of a wave. You can sort of convert from position space to momentum space. So I could say psi of x and t, or what is sometimes called psi tilde of p and t, two equivalent ways. You can go back and forth between these. One fixes the other one uh, exactly. And x and p, in this, in this quantum world are not coordinates for the particle, they are observables. So this is what we tried to emphasize, that there's no answer to the question in quantum mechanics, what is the position, what is the momentum? And that's why the uncertainty principle is not a statement about what you can measure. It's a statement about what the actual observables, how they relate to the wave function. There is no wave function that is perfectly definitely defined as a delta function in both position and momentum. So this is already kind of like a conceptual problem. How do we relate these observables that are not coordinates in a world where the ontology is a vector in Hilbert space to phase space, to this x and p, right, uh, that are going to have to have some behavior that we would hope that would look classical. So what we can do, Aaron Fest says, or anyone says, is uh, we can define expectation values. So this is a fancy way of saying, if we were to measure these observables, the position or the momentum, uh, if we were to start with the same wave function and measure position over and over again. So when you actually measure the position, the wave function collapses. So you have to imagine that there is some way of restarting the wave function exactly where it was, and you measure the position again and again and again, and you find out what is the average, okay? That's the expectation value. So you define x bar as a function of time. So you're not, this is a little, a little bit tricky to say, you're not actually measuring it. You're saying, hypothetically, were you to measure it over and over again, you can predict what the outcome would be and find the average of that. That's what this is. Uh, so you're not actually disturbing it, you're letting the wave function smoothly evolve and talking about how its expectation value evolves. So x of t can be written as the integral of x times the wave function over all possible x's, and likewise p of t, for reasons that are kind of complicated we're not going to get into, it's minus i times the derivative of psi with respect to x, dx, okay? I mean, that kind of makes some sense, right? Because the, the momentum has to do with how quickly the wave function is changing. But anyway, the point is that there are equations, right? Given the wave function, you can figure out the average value. And so now you have numbers, right? Before you just had a wave function, a vector in Hilbert space, by defining these expectation values, now you have numbers. It would be nice if these numbers, the expectation value of x and p, just obeyed these classical equations. Wouldn't that be nice, as the Beach Boys once said? Um, well, they don't, but they come very close, and in the right circumstances, they kind of do. So that's how Ehrenfest's theorem works. So what Ehrenfest says, what he proves, is that the derivative of the expectation value of x with respect to time. Remember, what we're trying to do is rederive these classical equations right here, Newton's laws. Um, turns out to be exactly what you would want, the expectation value of p divided by m. 
that one worked. Uh, but what about the derivative of p bar, the expectation value of the momentum? Well, it turns out to be minus, take the derivative of the potential with respect to x, and take its expectation value, okay? So this thing here, the thing in the bar, is the integral of dv dx times psi of x dx. So that looks pretty close. Like what we wanted was, you know, we had classically dp dt is minus dv dx. It would have been nice to get dp dp dt equals minus dv dx bar, right? So in other words, we were hoping for this equals minus dv evaluated at the average value of x uh, dx. So in other words, the difference between these two things, this and this, is this thing at the bottom, which is what we want, says go to the point which is the expectation value of x, the most likely place to see the particle, and ask what the slope of the potential is. That's what we want. That's what we want to be pushing around the particle. This thing at the top says, take all of the different points of the wave function, sample them by asking what is the slope of the potential there, okay? And that's what gives you the change of the expectation value of the momentum. But that's a quantity that has no, so if I have, I should draw a picture because this is otherwise gonna be impossible to understand. So here's V of X, okay, here's X, here's the potential that we drew, and let me draw a wave function. Let's imagine we have a wave function that you know has sort of different little parts to it. So this thing right here is saying, you know, there's some slope here, there's some slope there, there's some slope there. At all the different points where the wave function has support, there's some slope to the potential. Average all of them. That's what Ehrenfest's theorem actually says is relevant. But you can see, like, that's a completely irrelevant quantity in Newtonian mechanics. Newtonian mechanics wants you to actually have the slope of the potential where the particle is. And what you're coming across is the fact that in quantum mechanics, there's no such thing as where the particle is. So it's a little bit more difficult to interpret what's going on. I tend to dwell on this and be very uh, persnickety about it because I think that people uh, get it wrong very easily, but it's clear what to do. So what to do is consider cases where the wave function is localized near some particular location, okay? So this kind of wave function just makes no sense. That's not gonna work for Ehrenfest's theorem. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna give you classical behavior according to Ehrenfest's theorem. But what if we were lucky enough to have a situation where the potential looks like this and the wave function looks like this? Okay, then roughly speaking, all that matters is the value of the slope of the potential near where the wave function is peaked. So we call this a wave packet. A wave packet uh, is something where it's nearly localized in some particular place. And there's a formal mathematical way of saying this. It's the, the idea is that this, the width of the wave packet has to be small compared to the rate at which the slope of the potential is changing, okay, the second derivative of the potential. So there's a very mathematically precise way of saying your wave packet is localized enough to pretend that it has one single location. And then you can show that uh, minus dv dx expectation value turns into minus dv at x bar dx and then you get the classical limit back. So that's then just the force on the particle, okay? So what it's saying here is that Ehrenfest's theorem gives you classical motion for a quantum wave function in certain circumstances. Certain kinds of quantum wave functions can behave classically and some can't, okay? This kind of wave function has a chance of behaving classically. This is in the classical limit. This kind of wave function up here just doesn't behave classically at all. So you have to be a little bit careful about it. So everyone understands that, you know, sometimes they, they gloss over, you know, there's, there's a question, why is the wave function ever localized? So you have to answer that, but that, that those can be answered.
There's another thing, that, though, it, that is much more uh, subtle and interesting, which is, I mean, you know that when I localize a wave function, uh, that means that I know to pretty good precision what I will measure the position to be, which means that by the uncertainty principle, I don't know what I'll measure the momentum to be. Now, if the thing that I'm talking about is a big thing, is the Earth, for example, okay, uh, I can know the position to pretty good accuracy and the momentum to pretty good accuracy. So this is where bigness comes in. You notice that nowhere here in my discussion of Ehrenfest theorem that I say that the object was big. Well, because Ehrenfest theorem cares about the wave packets being localized, and then you can say that the instantaneous equation applies and gives you the classical limit, but if it spreads, if the, if the wave packet spreads very quickly, then it no longer applies. And so Ehrenfest theorem only gives you classical behavior for a minute, for a second, for a nanosecond. But if the particle is really, really big and heavy, the spread in both position and momentum can be small, or position and velocity can be small, and in that case, the classical limit remains true. But what about the other case? You know, there are cases where the momentum spreads, where the velocity, a small variation in velocity leads to a big difference, like for a single particle. So like for a single particle, like an electron moving through a bubble chamber, when you see that single track that looks pretty classical, it can't be because of Ehrenfest theorem. An electron is not at all heavy. An electron is light. It should spread out all over the place. Something else is going on. Uh, we know what's going on. We know the electron is being observed. Its wave function is being measured repeatedly by the bubble chamber, and that leads to decoherence. So that's a clue as to what is going on. So not just electrons. There exist big classical systems like the Earth. The Earth is not an example, but like the Earth that are, actually the Earth is an example, let me explain that, that are chaotic in their classical motions, okay? What, what chaos means, sadly it's not a whole big idea video by itself, but the chaos phenomenon is the situation where a small deviation in initial conditions leads to a very large, typically exponential deviation in the final place where the thing goes, okay? So in many cases, that's not true. If you drop two balls off of a building and watch them fall, if you drop them at slightly different times, they will still land at slightly different times. Chaotic behavior happens when slight deviations lead to huge deviations in the near future. Uh, so I said the Earth was not that, but it actually is, but the time scale for the chaotic behavior to show up is really, really long. So the Earth's orbit around the sun is chaotic if you give it a long enough time. We can't predict the position of all the planets in the solar system to very high precision a billion years in the future because of this chaotic behavior. Um, but there are systems that are much more chaotic, you know, chaotic on a much shorter time scale. Uh, so there are, my favorite example is Saturn's moon Hyperion. Uh, Hyperion is a little lumpy thing. It's a very tiny moon. It's just a captured asteroid that is a moon of Saturn, and it looks kind of like a potato, potato-shaped. And so this was worked out a while ago. The fact that it's a lumpy thing, so I don't know, I'm not going to be able to draw it very well. Hyperion, moon of Saturn, okay? Uh, it has different moments of inertia. You know, it's pulled and pushed by the tidal forces in Saturn and the other moons of Saturn, and therefore it tumbles, okay? So it I'm just going to write tumbles. What I'm going to do is, I'll do this. I'm going to try to find a video <laughs> of Hyperion, and I'm going to try to put it into the file that I published in this YouTube video. So we'll see if we can embed a video, a level of technological sophistication I've never actually done before. But what you see when you look at the video, even if it's only in your mind's eye, is that Hyperion tumbles, and it tumbles chaotically. Because it's being pushed and pulled by all these other things in Saturn's orbit, Hyperion just sort of wobbles in an unpredictable way. So if you think that Hyperion is really a quantum system, it's big, you know, it's, it's heavier than you are, that's for sure, uh, but a small deviation in its orientation, if you didn't know exactly how it was oriented classically, the classical trajectories quickly diverge. You can't predict what attitude, what orientation Hyperion is going to be in. If you translate that to the behavior of the wave function for Hyperion, what it means is if you start Hyperion, this tumbling potato-shaped moon of Saturn, in a wave function that is peaked around some particular orientation and uh, rotational velocity, 
that wave function will quickly spread out over all these different possibilities. So if all you thought about was the wave function of Hyperion, and you made a prediction for what it is, you know, a year later, it should look like a blob, like a spherical cloud of probability. It should not look like a picture that you can take. We've taken pictures from NASA. Uh, the video I'm gonna show you is just a simulation. It's not really uh, photographs, but it's based on photographs. Um, it looks like there is a planet there with a real, a moon, an asteroid, a former asteroid that is now a moon with an actual position and location like classical things should have. Why does it look classical to us? Aaron Fest theorem does not give you the answer. The wave packet of the orientation of Hyperion is chaotic and should spread out over a short time scale. Uh, the answer is decoherence, of course. It's the same answer as for the electron. The point is that Hyperion is in the solar system. It is constantly being bombarded by photons, for example, as well as by other things. And they're essentially branching the wave function of the universe. Or if you like, they are uh, measuring the wave function of Hyperion all the time. And so what that means is that there is an effective emergent description of what Hyperion is doing that is classical, but not deterministically classical. So what you get is a stochastic classical dynamics. So this combination of quantum mechanics and chaos theory is saying that uh, not only if you didn't measure the state of Hyperion exactly, would it be unpredictable? It's saying it is unpredictable. Measure it all you want, because you can't put its wave function into a state where it won't spread out and then be observed and be branched in different ways by the environment around it, okay? So there's still classical behavior in a quantumly chaotic system, but it's a little bit more subtle. You gotta think a little bit more about how it gets there, and you can't just look at the system itself. You have to include the environment and decoherence and so forth. Okay, uh, I see an hour has gone by. Two more things I want to tell you. One is kind of, um, kind of a stretch, but that's okay. You're very much smarter and well-informed now than you than where you were 20 videos ago or whatever it was when we started this whole series. Uh, I wanna tell you about the fact that, because now that we understand emergence and now we understand how you know classical uh, physics relates to quantum physics, so we've gone both ways, let's, let's pause and say that. When we first did quantum mechanics, we emphasized that the typical way that you made a quantum mechanical theory was to start with a classical theory and quantize it. And we said, look, nature probably doesn't do that. I mean, nature probably just is quantum from the start, but nevertheless, that's the way we do it. And what we've just done is to remind you that you can go the other way as well. You can start with a quantum mechanical theory and get a classical behavior from it in the right circumstances. So the domain of applicability of that classical theory will be smaller than the domain of the quantum theory, but that's okay. What I wanna do now is mention the fact that this going back and forth is not unique. Okay, there is no rule that says that given a quantum theory, there is only one classical theory you can get from it. Uh, or the other way around, given a classical theory, you can quantize it, and, and now there's non-uniqueness both ways. Given a classical theory, you can quantize it in different ways. This is a well-known thing, operator, operator ordering ambiguities people talk about. Not that interesting, to be honest. More interesting is, there are two different classical theories that you can quantize and get the same quantum theory. Two very different classical theories. And this is just so mind stretchy, uh, mind boggling and weird that I, even though it's beyond what we're normally doing here in The Greatest Ideas, I have to explain it to you. So let me give you an example. Um, ex let me say, say what I'm giving you an example of. Uh, one quantum theory can arise by quantizing to, or maybe more, different, come on, spell, different classical theories. This blew my mind anyway when I first uh, was shown this example uh, in grad school. So here is the example. Again, not something you will normally be told in uh, pop physics discussions, but that's okay. This is something called the Sine-Gordon theory. The Klein-Gordon theory, you might remember, it's just the theory of a scalar field. 
just you know doing whatever it wants. Um, a scalar field with some potential v of phi. So scalar field phi potential v of phi. And Sidney Coleman, <clears throat> my old quantum field theory professor from grad school, wrote a paper about a particular theory, Klein-Gordon theory, uh, where you took the potential to be looking like the sine of phi. So a potential that went up and down. So you have phi, v of phi, and then the potential looks like this. Okay, so as a joke, he called it the sine Gordon theory, and sadly, everyone loved that name, and he was very chagrined. He was slightly embarrassed that people loved that name and they kept it, but that's what we call it now, the sine Gordon theory, okay? And in particular, so I want to, so this is just a theory of a scalar field with this kind of potential. That's, that's what it is. And in particular, let's look at it in one plus one dimensions. So one plus one, two. Still true, but we're talking about, we say one plus one because we mean one dimension of space, one dimension of time. So we have a line that evolves with time and there's a scalar field moving around, wiggling in this particular potential. So usually it wants to wiggle near the bottom of the potential, but sometimes maybe it'll hop over the top, you know, depending on what's happening, okay? So basically there are two things, I'll just say what I just said again, there are two things that can happen. There can be like small oscillations near the bottom and in the quantum theory those would just show up as particles right scalar bosons spin zero particles but then there are also configurations that go from one minimum to another right and we might remember we talked a little bit about that idea when we talked about topology because this is a topological defect known as a domain wall if you have two different minimum points of the vacuum, two different vacua, two different minimum points of the potential, uh, that the field is in one of them over here, one of them over here, then in between there needs to be energy when the field climbs over the potential to get there. So in one plus one dimensions, you can plot that, right? So here's x. Now this is um, here in this plot, phi was the horizontal axis. Now phi is the vertical axis and x is the vertical axis. X is the horizontal axis. So I can imagine a situation where phi is, let's say if I continued this down, right? So here's a minimum, there's a minimum. There's a situation where phi is in one minimum, and then it sort of quickly goes up to the next minimum. So if this is, uh, call it minus v and plus v, this is minus v and plus v. Okay, And this is, for unfortunate historical reasons, called the kink solution. Get all of your kinky jokes out of the way right now, but it, you can see it's sort of a kink in the field. It goes up and it goes down, so there you go. So this is a theory that has both particles sitting at the bottom of the potential, and it has these domain walls kink solutions, okay? Uh, and in general, you would have both. Here is, the, here is the miracle. These small oscillations, as we said, they're just scalar bosons. They're pretty typical. If you look at the bottom of a sine potential or a cosine potential or whatever, uh, I think we even mentioned the fact that it looks kind of like a parabola. So it kind of looks like a simple harmonic oscillator. So it kind of looks like ordinary things we've already quantized and talked about, ordinary scalar bosons with different masses, as long as the oscillations are very tiny compared to the variation of the potential. But there's also these kinks, and these kinks themselves are kind of particle-like. You know, if, if we were in three dimensions, then a domain wall is a big thing that stretches across the universe. But if you're on a line, right, if you only have one dimension of space, then a particle is just something that's located at one point in space. And this kink is also kind of located at one point in space, right? I put it here at zero, but I could have put it anywhere. Uh, in fact, it can even, you know, I could expand this a little bit. I could take this picture over here. I could let space go on a bit here. And I could imagine a, a configuration that stayed in this vacuum and then it went back down to the other vacuum. Right? So this would be, if this is a kink over here, this is an anti-kink going the other way. So you could have a series of kinks and anti-kinks and then go up and down. Again, get all the jokes out of your system. And when a kink and an anti-kink hit each other, they annihilate, right? They go away because you can just flop over. So this whole situation over time 
can evolve into something with just has some vibrations and then goes like that, right? The kink and the anti-kink can just annihilate. So all of those words, the kink solution looks like a particle, especially if, you know, the parameters of the potential are such that it's very thin. It kind of looks like a particle. It has a position, it has a velocity, and a kink has anti-kinks, and they can annihilate. It makes them sound like particles. In fact, it makes them sound like fermions, doesn't it? It makes them sound kind of like electrons. You know, there's particles and antiparticles, and they can annihilate, right? So what Coleman showed um, in his paper is that there is another theory of fermions that is a classical Lagrangian you can write down with the feature that when you quantize it, you get exactly the same theory as when you quantize the sine gordon theory. So that fermion theory is called the massive Turing model. I'm not going to go into details here, but it's a specific model of fermions. I forgot a letter in Mr. Turing's name. It's a specific theory of fermions and anti-fermions in one-dimensional space, okay? That's what it is. You can write it down. It has a Lagrangian, etc. And so then you can compare the sine gordon theory to the massive Turing theory. And in the sine gordon theory, you have uh, scalar bosons and you have domain walls or kinks. In the massive Turing theory, you have fermions, because that's what you put in. The fundamental degrees of freedom are fermions. But, you know, if you take an electron and a proton, two fermions, put them together to make a hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom has spin zero or spin one, depending on how the spins align, right? So the hydrogen atom is a boson. It's made of two spin one half particles, and you get either a spin zero or spin one combination, depending on whether they're aligned or anti-aligned. So you can, and that's a generic fact, you can take two spin one half fermions, and if they bind together, you can make a spin zero or, or a other spin boson. Uh, bound states of fermions are bosons. So you get bosonic bound states. And what Coleman was able to do was show that these theories are exactly the same at the quantum mechanical level. The scalar bosons in the sine gordon theory map onto the bound states of fermion-antifermion in the massive Turing model, and the domain walls in the sine gordon theory map on to the fundamental fermions in the massive Turing theory. Domain walls in the sine gordon theory map onto the fundamental fermions in the massive Turing theory. So I'm not going to go to the details here. Obviously, you can look up papers. Uh, there's this whole uh, idea. This is a, a broader idea called bosonization. In one plus one dimensional field theories, it very often is the case that you can describe things using fermions or they bind up into bosons. So again, the claim, I'll just repeat the claim. I can write down a Lagrangian in one plus one dimensions for a scalar field with a sinusoidal potential, the sine Gordon theory. I can write down a completely different looking Lagrangian for a fermion in one plus one dimension that interacts with itself in certain ways, has an antiparticle, the massive Turing model. And then I can do quantum mechanics. I can quantize both Lagrangians and I can show that both theories are secretly exactly the same quantum theory. So two different classical theories giving rise to the same quantum mechanical theory. And not just, you know, uh, some different parameters or some different labels. One is a theory of bosons, the other is a theory of fermions. So the point of this is, if you were to say, given this quantum mechanical theory, what is it really? Given the quantum mechanical theory, which is just some Hamiltonian operator acting on Hilbert space, given that, is this really a theory of bosons or is this really a theory of fermions? The answer is there's no answer. There's no answer to that question. This description that you made up in terms of bosons and fermions is a classical language. And then you quantize the theory to get the real true theory, which is the quantum theory. And there's more than one classical theory that you can quantize to get this quantum theory. So the answer is, what is it really? What is the true fundamental stuff that we're talking about here is not a question that has an answer. All this talk about bosons and fermions, uh, which is the theory really made of and which are just the emergent ones, 
That's not an answerable question in, in this particular model. Good. If you liked that, you're going to love the next example of the same thing, which is something you maybe have heard of, which is the ADS-CFT correspondence. So my point in showing you the sine gordon turing model correspondence was to say we can quantize two theories. One is fermions, one is bosons. Show they're really the same theory. Okay, uh, so you don't need to start from the same starting point to make a quantum theory that is really the same. The, the classical starting points can be very different. The ADS-CFT correspondence is an example where you start with two different theories in two different dimensional spacetimes, and you get the same quantum theory. At least we think you do, or at least you do in certain regimes, and the details are a little bit much less clear here because gravity is involved here. But that's why it's exciting, as well as why it's incompletely understood. So ADS is anti de Sitter space, which is a solution to Einstein's equations with a cosmological constant, lambda, the vacuum energy, the energy of empty space, less than zero, a negative value for the cosmological constant. So this is a cosmological solution with nothing else in it, so no particles, no radiation, just empty space with nothing but negative vacuum energy. De Sitter space is the solution you get with nothing but positive vacuum energy, so this is anti de Sitter space. And CFT means conformal field theory. So in conformal field theory is just a, an example of a quantum field theory. Conformal, though, means that it is completely scale-free. There are no parameters in the theory that pick out a certain length scale. So if you, for example, have any particles that have a mass, then you do not have a conformal field theory because a mass for a particle picks out a Compton wavelength, and that's a length scale. Conformal field theory looks exactly the same at every length scale. If you went to you know, uh, QED, quantum electromagnetism, at very, very, very low energies, well below the energy of the electrons, you had really nothing but photons interacting with each other, that's almost a conformal field theory. It's not quite because of details, because the electrons are kind of still there in some sense. Um, but a conformal the field theory is really exactly the same at all scales, so it's kind of a weird kind of field theory. But uh, the conformal field theory does not have gravity. So the conformal field theory we're talking about here is just a quantum field theory. It's perfectly well-defined. You can write down the Lagrangian. You can quantize it. You can do all the quantum field theory you want. The anti de Sitter theory we're talking about here is gravity, in fact, supergravity, in fact, string theory on anti de Sitter space. So that's much less well-defined. You know, we have some ideas about what that is like, but this is a true, the idea is, the claim, the hope, the aspiration, is that this is a true theory of quantum gravity in a certain background. So what we know how to do is look at small deviations, look at particles or even black holes in that background. But it is not, you know, some people complain because it's not a completely background independent theory, and that's a fair complaint. This is a theory where at least the boundary conditions are those of anti de Sitter space. So what is the relationship between these two theories? The relationship is the following. Uh, remember we were drawing pictures when we talked about gravity, we drew different pictures of uh, the Kruskal diagram for the black hole. Um, the Kruskal diagram has this nice property that light cones are always at 45 degrees. So that's a, a step along the way to a more elaborate thing called a Penrose diagram or a Carter Penrose diagram. Brandon Carter and Roger Penrose uh, invented a way to draw whole space times, even if they're infinitely big, draw them in a finite piece of paper. So here's the Penrose diagram for anti de Sitter space. It looks like a cylinder. And it has the property, I said finite piece of paper, I know, but in this picture, time goes up eternally, and space is the interior here, and space is finite, sorry, space is infinite, anti de Sitter space is an open universe that goes on forever, but I've drawn it in such a way such that it fits into this disk here, okay, I've contracted it like that. So this interior of this cylinder is anti de Sitter space, okay? And it has a boundary, it has a boundary that looks like a cylinder, like the edge of a cylinder, right? And so the, this was first done by Juan Maldacena in uh, 1996, maybe, something like that, 
97, 98, around there, you know. Um, I was a postdoc at the time. And what Maldacena was studying was ADS in, let's say, four plus one dimensions. Don't ask why, but there's good string theory reasons why that was a logical thing to study. So the boundary of ADS is this cylinder. It looks like it's a circle times time, but the circle is infinitely big, so it's really just flat, okay? If you take a circle or a sphere and make it bigger and bigger, it looks locally flatter and flatter. So this is literally an infinitely big sphere, which is the equivalent to flat space time. And the boundary then is three plus one dimensional, and you can define a conformal field theory on it. So in other words, you have two different space times. You have the space-time inside, which is a five-dimensional anti-de-sitter space, and you can define gravity on that. You can have gravity and other forces of nature, strings and other things that would appear in supergravity. So you can do quantum gravity in five-dimensional anti-de-sitter space. Then you can also completely separately have a theory, a quantum field theory, a conformal field theory, without gravity on the boundary. Okay, which is one dimension lower. In this case, it's three plus one dimensional. And what Maldacena says is that these two theories are the same. These two classical languages, this language of conformal fields moving in flat space-time of four dimensions total, and this other classical language of gravity in five-dimensional space-time with anti de boundary conditions, they are two different ways of talking about the same quantum mechanical theory. This is called a duality uh, between these two descriptions. The sine gordon Massatori model is also called a duality. You can think of a duality as two different classical versions of the same quantum mechanical theory. And I can't do much, I can't do much about the details of anti de sitter space and the conformal field theory, but the point is, I'm just trying to drive home how true it is when I say that nature works as a quantum mechanical theory, and every time we talk about a classical theory, that's just convenient to us, okay? Uh, this example was two different classical theories, one bosons, one fermions, but they're just secretly two different ways of talking about the same quantum theory. This is two different theories, one with gravity in five dimensions and one without gravity in four dimensions. And again, the same theory. You might say, well, there must be more degrees of freedom in five dimensions than four dimensions, but that's not true because in both cases, there is an infinite number of degrees of freedom and infinity is still infinity. Infinity times infinity is infinity. Um, and this is, you know, the, the most, most obvious beloved manifestation of the holographic principle. The holographic principle being the idea that in a black hole or other places where you have a horizon or gravity is important, you can encode all the information about space-time in one lower dimension on the horizon of a black hole or something like that. Here you're encoding all of the information about the five-dimensional anti de sitter space in the four-dimensional boundary. You can, you can, there's a dictionary. It's not perfect. Again, you know, we don't know as much about this. Uh, as we want, but we've tested the conjecture and it's very, very strongly supported. So we believe that any question you can ask in that five-dimensional anti-de sitter space can be answered in terms of a question asked on the four-dimensional boundary theory. And these days, there's a very, I'm just going to say the words, I'm not going to explain anything at all, but there's a very exciting idea called entanglement wedge reconstruction. I'm just going to give you the buzzwords here. Uh, and basically, this is an approach to thinking about black holes in anti de sitter space evaporating. So remember, I, I told you about the black hole information loss problem. Here's an example in this anti de sitter space in, four, in five dimensions. Well, I could make a black hole there because gravity exists in this theory, and I could let it evaporate. And I just promised you that any question I asked in anti de sitter space quantum gravity should be answerable in the boundary conformal field theory where gravity does not exist and all of the obstacles to understanding quantum gravity are irrelevant. So I should be able to make a black hole, watch it evaporate, and ask what happened from the point of view of the boundary. So people have been trying to do that now for over 20 years, and 
The, the problem is, yes, you can do that, but actually seeing how the information gets out has eluded us so far. So this approach of entanglement wedge reconstruction seems to be a set of clues um, about how the information can get out of black holes in this case. Not something I'm going to talk about right here, but you know, maybe a future podcast uh, I'll try to get into this. Anyway, we yet again, another way of saying quantum mechanics is what the world is made of, classical physics can emerge in different ways. The CFT and the ADS theory are two different emergent descriptions of the same underlying quantum theory. Okay, final topic, <laughs> which is completely different. Now for something completely different uh, about emergence is weak versus strong emergence. Right? This is nothing to do with quantum mechanics, even fundamental physics, really, but maybe it does. Uh, and it, I alluded to this idea earlier, this idea of um, when the macroscopic theory emerges, is there a sense in which, in principle, in Laplace's demon type fashion, you could figure out what was going on from the point of view of the microscopic theory? Um, so that's weak emergence, if you believe that that is possible. So we mean we don't mean like it's less strong or powerful we mean it's a it's a weaker notion it's claiming less okay weak emergence strong emergence is something a more radical claim that's what it means to be strong in this case so in weak emergence the macro theory is let's call it autonomous which means to say within the macro theory the theory of gases or whatever i can ask questions and i can answer them without knowing what is going on in the micro theory. That's the sense in which it is autonomous. Uh, but it can be simulated exactly by the micro theory. So in principle, you're saying I have some box of gas, I'm gonna predict what it's gonna do next. But you're also saying that if I knew exactly what the phase space point was for all the atoms and particles in the box, and I knew all the microscopic laws of physics, I could put that on a computer, figure out what would happen next, and I could also derive what would happen to the box of gas, okay? So in other words, um, in weak emergence, you imagine that there is some micro theory and the micro theory has a lot of different states, right? There's a lot of different, this is not space I'm drawing here. This is the space of states in the microscopic theory, whatever that might be, maybe wave functions or whatever. And then there's a map from that micro theory to the macro theory. And let's imagine this is a sort of coarse graining situation. So there are fewer states in the macro theory. And the claim of weak emergence is that given some particular state in the micro theory, I can literally map it to a state in the macro theory. I can also evolve it in time, right, to a different state. I don't know what it does. It goes up here and I have many, many, many states once again. And the laws of physics in the micro world give me what micro state it goes to. And I can play the same game in the macro theory. And I can show that this goes to some other macro state. And the point is that there still is a map from the micro theory to the macro theory, and this diagram commutes, as we say, in the math literature. In other words, starting from this micro state, with those two different colors, you can follow it, you can either go to the macro theory and then evolve it, or you could evolve it and then go to the macro theory and you get the same answer, right? That's what it means to have weak emergence. You can evolve in the macro theory, but you could also equally well evolve in the micro theory. Strong emergence, which let me just tell you, I don't think exists, <laughs> but people talk about it, so I feel like I should mention it. Strong emergence says, no, you can't. In other words, strong emergence is the idea that um, there is a micro theory and there is a macro theory but the macro theory, even if it looks like the macro theory is describing a large collection of micro things, the rules of the game are fundamentally different in the macro theory. They are not reducible, they are not simulatable on a computer. There's something that is truly new that is coming out in the macro realm. Um, in fact, in many social sciences, uh, that's the way this 
particular word emergence is usually used. If you, if you Google the British emergentists, uh, you will find a whole bunch of people who say exactly this, that you, know, you can't reduce what happens in large groups of people to small numbers of people, to the collective behavior thereof. There's some fundamentally new, non-simulatable thing, and that's what strong emergence would be about. So I don't believe that actually happens in the world, but I do want to say that it could. You know, I want to be open to the possibility. So what would that mean in the, in the language that we previously talked about? Um, what it means is something like this. Like, here's reality. What it means is basically, so here's why I don't believe it. Because let's say that you're thinking like a physicist and your micro theory is the standard model of particle physics or the core theory, so we can include gravity. Um, there's a Lagrangian, right? There's an equation for the standard model plus gravity. And like it or not, for any given wave function, you plug it in and that Lagrangian, or in the Schrodinger equation, you convert it to a Hamiltonian, it will tell you how that wave function evolves uniquely. Right? There's no ambiguity there. So if you make the strong emergence claim, if you say that in principle, the behavior of a human being, let's say, cannot be reduced to the behavior of the atoms and molecules and forces that make up that human being, you're saying the Lagrangian and the standard model must be wrong. You can't say it's completely right and never violated, but it's insufficient to predict what is going to happen for a human being. Those two statements are incompatible with each other. And it's very, very hard to imagine the ways in which you would violate the Lagrangian for the standard model macroscopically, but not microscopically, okay? I mean, you can say the words, but no one has ever come close to writing down equations or actually giving a principled suggestion for what the new laws of physics would be. That's why it's very hard. And in some sense, um, the reason why it's very hard is this idea that we have of locality, right? I mean, it's, it's built into the framework of the standard model that the world is a quantum field theory. And quantum fields exist at different points. The quantum wave function has entanglement between different points, but the fields that you're entangling exist at various points, and they interact at the same point in space. We talked about this many videos ago in the force and action uh, and energy video. Locality is really the underlying thing that makes quantum field theory go. Um, and what you need to do if you want to believe in strong emergence is to give up on that locality in some fundamental way. You need to give up on the idea that not only are the laws different, but you have to give up on the idea, sorry, not only are the laws the same, but there's, it's even correct to think about a human being as just a collection of uh, electrons and protons and neutrons. So the way I would do it in terms of the pictures that I drew before is you have reality, you have our micro theory, which might be the core theory, the standard model. And then you have some macro theory, which is your favorite theory of, I don't know, consciousness or whatever. And the claim is that the macro theory is not a subset of the micro theory. So there is a domain of applicability for the micro theory, and there's a domain of applicability for the macro theory that looks like this, right? So there's a whole part of reality which is described by the macro theory but is not described by the micro theory. That's when strong emergence is conceivable. So you're saying that, sure, if I look at what happens to one electron, uh, bumping into some small number of other electrons, then the standard model describes it perfectly. But once it's surrounded by Avogadro's number of electrons, then the standard model fails to describe it. That is outside the realm of validity, uh, of applicability of the theory. There's no reason, I think, in fundamental physics to suspect that anything like that actually happens. The only reason is, you know, I think that the, the advocates for this would say, well, they want to understand consciousness, and they don't think the consciousness is explicable in terms of what happens in the standard model of particle physics. I think it is. Your opinion may differ, but I'm offering this as a peace offering to people who actually believe in strong emergence. I think they should be more clear about what it could possibly mean. I think this is what it could possibly mean. If you could try to make it work quantitatively in terms of equations and so forth, good for you. That would be a huge progress. I don't think it's the way to go, but, you know, emergence is murky. There's probably a lot that we have yet to learn.